Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here to the European tribute to Henry Hasman, professor. Uh, we are here at Universidad Pontificia Comillas in Madrid, and uh, now we start with the with the tribute in the first uh, step. Uh, the introduction and welcome is uh, uh, for uh, Professor Rafa Sebastian, uh, commercial law professor here in our university and a partner of the law firm Uria Menendez. Thank you so much, Rafa. Okay, good afternoon, dear organizers, uh, Miguel, Maribel, guest and speaker here in Madrid, and also welcome to those connected remotely, especially Professor Hall. When I was living in the US, I remember that Mr. Clinton said, that we have to apply to the rule, don't tell, don't, don't, don't ask, don't tell. In other words, if they, if they ask you what your first name, you don't have to provide your last name or your identity card. Here we are going to, to use exactly the opposite rule. We are going to tell about everything about Mr. Professor Hasman. So we are here today, let me start saying that we are here today to pay an European tribute to Professor Henry Hasman at this conference organized by Comilla Law Faculty, Yuria Menendez Forhan and the European Corporate Government Institute. Thank you to all of you for, make, for making this event possible and for getting together in one room this diverse panel of brilliant speakers. One of the late motives of this afternoon discussion is the relationship between law and economics. As we are aware, these are two disciplines closely, closely interweaving. The main purpose of law, especially corporate law, is to facilitate economic transactions and the cooperation amongst individuals. After all, the market economy is based on individual property and freedom to contract properly cannot be ensured without solid free legal framework. And freedom to contact amongst individuals and to contract among the individuals and to freely associate with must also be guaranteed by law and the states through enforcement of the Pacta Sun Servanda and by protecting individual rights which are traded in the market. We can say in a nutshell that today's presentation are part of the economic analysis of law and its two-fold role, contributed of to economic development and when necessary, putting a spoke to the wills of the functioning of the economy and promoting overall social welfare. Across different jurisdictions, corporate law presents in a common structure to address fundamental similar legal and economic problems as a study in the foundation of corporate law by Professor Hasman and other authors. In this regard, Professor Hasman's work has been a keystone to this analysis. His influential work through the years of corporate law and the structure of property and organization has definitely shaped how scholars in Europe and overseas approach the study of organizations. Just as the economy evolves, so does corporate law, again, due to the proximity between both disciplines. For instance, the investment protection rules has adopted to the evolution of business corporation, going from restricting voting rules to protect shareholders as they were consumers, to the today well-established rule of one share, one vote, a transformation described as a turning point to the, in the history of the business corporation by Hanman and Mariana, who will be later given a special address in praise of Professor Hasman. This afternoon, we can find great examples of the impact of this contribution to legal and economic scholarship, from the Roman family to corporate groups going through bankruptcy, and ultimately, corporate governance as the corollary of the regulation and organization and their ownership. All this topic has been discussed in this, will be, has been distributed in three sessions, where Professor of Law, Business and Economic will present and discuss original papers to pay tribute to Professor Hadman's academic achievement and explore the broad influence of his work. I would like to give a special thanks to the speakers who are coming to this event or connecting from all over the world and whose contributors are very much appreciated. Once again, I welcome to all of you and hope we can find a pleasant afternoon and we will have a fruitful discussion in honor of Professor Hasman. Um, so, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the first session uh, of today's afternoon. And I would like to start by quoting one of Professor Hansman's earlier works uh, from year 1986 uh, in the Journal of Law, Economics and Organization. This work was entitled A Theory of Status Organizations. And in this, in this paper, he says, Wherever the personal characteristics of one's fellows are important as a source of utility, incentives for exclusivity will be present to preserve status. Uh, so therefore, it's clear that I want to thank 
to thank the organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to be in this very exclusive club here uh, and to increase both my status and my knowledge uh, listening to these uh, to these uh, wonderful papers that we have today um, and uh, this first session uh, is going to be on groups and subsidiaries and uh, of course, this is, this is a wonderful opportunity to discuss the complexities of ownership, which is one of the key problems um, where Professor Hansman has illuminated uh, the road okay, for, for academics. And uh, in particular, this is also a topic of great relevance for European academics. Um, so um, that's all from my part, and please join me in welcoming our distinguished speakers for this first session, Professor Andreas Engert and Professor Mariana Pardiendre. Okay, uh, would you? Oops. <laughs> okay, great. Let me let me see if that works. Yeah, it does. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for for having me. It's it's a great pleasure and and also a great honor to be contributing to this uh, symposium in in honor of uh, Professor Hansmann. Um, when I was asked to contribute, I I I, I thought it should be something uh, obviously that that will be of hopefully of interest to uh, Professor Hansman, but also something along the lines of explaining uh, institutions. And uh, yeah, that uh, led me to this very long-standing project of mine uh, that is still in flux, as you can judge from the fact that I changed the title <laughs> uh, in, in between when uh, the program was, was uh, put together and now. Uh, so I'm trying to, to provide a uh, an explanation and efficiency reason for corporate groups. Uh, that is also a question that, that uh, has been obviously on the mind of uh, Professor Hansman. Uh, I mean, he, there's this recent uh, survey kind of uh, handbook uh, contribution together with uh, Richard Squire uh, about asset partitioning and, and how, whether or not that explains uh, why we see the corporate group as a uh, form of structuring uh, business of structuring uh, firms. So the question really is um, if uh, corporate groups, as we probably all agree, are controlled by a single ultimate parent, uh, so there is unified control, uh, why then are there so many different entities in, in, in corporate groups? And there are several candidate answers for that. Uh, probably the most prominent one is uh, it's a way to, to shield the firm against uh, liability, especially tort liability. That's not the kind of uh, explanation that, that I'm, uh, I, I'm seeking, because that obviously would be an explanation with an inefficiency, with uh, something that's, uh, that, that, that builds on an externality. Uh, turning to, to efficiency, uh, one very prominent explanation that has been given by originally by Richard Posner in the mid-1970s uh, was uh, that perhaps uh, groups with asset partitioning serve to allow uh, lenders to specialize on particular entities and specialize their, their monitoring uh, efforts. Uh, and that would be a good thing. Uh, that sounds like, like a great idea. Uh, the problem with this explanation, and, and uh, Professor Hansman and, and uh, Richard Squire have pointed this out, is that we don't, we rarely see groups where uh, liability is really, liability for, uh, for financial debt is really confined uh, to uh, single entities, usually there are cross liabilities that uh, uh, effectively extend liability to the, to the entire group. Uh, I want to mention uh, another uh, efficiency rationale that has been put forward by Professor Hansman uh, uh, in joint work uh, with Professor Ayotte, uh, which is the idea that uh, different entities could serve to bundle contracts that are complementary to each other. Uh, and uh, allow uh, 
the counterparty to, to secure themselves by, by bundling them in, in a single entity, allow counterparties to secure themselves against uh, opportunism uh, on the part of the firm, uh, because those contracts uh, then cannot be assigned individually, separately, but all, only as a bundle. Uh, and that, as you will see, is, is, uh, is remotely similar to, to uh, the idea that, that, that I have in mind. So my paper is going to put forward an organizational uh, explanation, uh, uh, an efficiency rationale that focuses on the uh, incentives within the firm and the incentives not of lenders, as uh, in the, in the Posner, Pos Posnerian view, uh, but on non-financial uh, stakeholders who are, who are also not uh, owners. So um, when we think about the puzzle of corporate groups, I think we have to take into account two basic facts. One is, uh, I mean, they are just ubiquitous and they are used extensively. So uh, for instance, this is from, from, a, from a recent study about uh, European uh, groups uh, and the average number of entities in those groups uh, for uh, groups with assets uh, uh, above 10 million euros, the average number of entities in those groups, so 16. And of course, there are also groups with hundreds of uh, entities. So this is one fact, the intensive use of, uh, uh, of entity separation. Uh, the other fact is that most of those entities uh, do not involve minority shareholders. So uh, this is a, a sample that, that I collected a couple of years ago. Uh, so three quarter of, of those entities in, in, in groups did not have outside shareholders, so were wholly owned uh, by the group, by uh, the parent. And now if, if we try to come up with an uh, explanation in terms of, of incentives for um, stakeholders within the firm, uh, then a good starting point, I think, is uh, Grossman Hart uh, Moore's uh, very uh, venerable uh, framework of uh, the property rights theory of the firm. And if, uh, if I can just recall this for you, um, the idea is that uh, there are two parties that, that have to somehow collab collaborate to, to, pr uh, to produce an, a, a final output. Uh, say A produces car engines. I'm sorry, I'm, it's an old project that, that was before Tesla. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, the, the example is a bit aged. Um, so uh, one uh, sort of person uh, produces or, or uh, entity uh, unit produces a car engine. The other uh, uses those car engines, uh, integrates them in, in cars and manufactures cars and sells them uh, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the market. So, and, and the problem now is that both of these inputs require uh, investment of uh, non-contractable effort, of effort uh, in attention, in, in, in trying to, to be creative, to, to uh, come up with the best technical solution for each of the two uh, uh, inputs. And, and the problem now is how to incentivize. Uh, those. And the first approach to this is simply uh, to put both of these uh, different productions, production activities into different uh, uh, firms. So to have two separate firms, uh, and that will give both parties an incentive to, uh, to uh, optimize their uh, input because ultimately they have to uh, exchange uh, their, their products. And in exchanging them, they will uh, divide the surplus between uh, them so they will both share in the in the added value uh, from from the ultimate uh, uh, product and and sharing gives them not perfect incentives but uh, each of them uh, has at least uh, some incentive to to contribute and to 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 innovate innovate etc to 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 maximize the the joint service so that that would be the the case of separate firms and then uh, there could be uh, a, 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 an alternative. Uh, arrangement when we believe that A's investment is somehow more important than what we should probably do is integrate the two activities in one firm, uh, a firm that is owned by uh, A, and then A, because uh, he will uh, capture the entire surplus that is being produced, has perfect incentives uh, to put in uh, yeah, optimal effort. Um, oh, yeah, optimal effort. Um, the problem with this, of course, is that now, since B is no longer sharing in the, in the uh, surplus, uh, B's incentives uh, deteriorate. Okay, so this is the trade-off, the classic trade-off in, in, uh, in Grossman uh, and Hart in the 1986 paper. Um, what many people now have associated with groups, and, and I think rightly so, is that groups could be some mixture of the, of the two. Uh, because groups, I mean, it, it is a single firm because it's it's its uh, control is unified. But at the same time, we have this sense that 
the fact that there are different entities gives uh, yeah other parties in the uh, uh, in the firm uh, also some degree of ownership. And what I'm essentially trying to do is uh, provide a more uh, explicit reason how that uh, how that combination might might work and and how that uh, that uh, sort of diluted weakened ownership by B uh, how that might uh, come about. Okay, so here's the key idea. The, the idea is that uh, in uh, an integrated firm, you have these stakeholders that, for instance, are in charge of uh, producing, of manufacturing uh, the car, also designing the car. And, and these can be manifold uh, stakeholders, uh, ranging from managers, employees, but also outside suppliers, etc., who have to specialize uh, in the production of the, uh, in the manufacturing of the uh, of the cars, for instance, uh, one of the of the two uh, inputs. Um, so, and and they, as in, in Grossman and Hart, uh, they have to make an effort, an effort that is non-contractable. So you can never find out whether engineers have given their best to design the best uh, engine or design the best uh, a car, etc. So that's the kind of effort we we want to uh, induce. And, and now the the problem is, for simplicity, let's just assume that um, these stakeholders that that we want to incentivize they are paid by a fixed claim uh, uh contract so so say a labor contract where, where they are receiving uh, a fixed wage uh that fixed wage will be above their reservation price so it, it it will reward them for specializing uh in the firm so they can earn a quasi rent uh by uh sticking to that uh contract but at the same time obviously a fixed claim contract cannot incentivize anyone to do any anything special uh, so, and, and we need to, uh, to address uh, this problem. And the, the argument of the paper is going to be uh, that the group form gives parents essentially a, a, a right, an opportunity to, to relinquish the subsidiary. Uh, and this, which, which I call uh, the bankruptcy option of the parents. And that bankruptcy option, uh, to some degree, makes those fixed claims contingent on the performance of the subsidiary, on the value the subsidiary has uh, for the uh, for the uh, group as a whole, for the firm. Okay, um, so now let's talk about this bankruptcy option. That's, I mean, especially in a, in a symposium uh, uh, in honor of uh, uh, Professor Hansmann, that's that's no news at all. It has to do, obviously, with uh, uh, entity separation, with asset partitioning. Um, here, it's, it's, I would argue, it's not the, the sort of the, the key is not entity shielding of the subsidiary, so giving stakeholders, creditors of the subsidiary priority to the subsidiary's assets. It's rather that uh, good old limited liability plus entity shielding of other uh, group entities. So the fact that subsidiary creditors cannot uh, uh, lay claims to any assets outside the subsidiary. So they are confined to the uh, assets uh, of the subsidiary uh, uh, itself. And what this liability confinement does uh, is that it gives the parent uh, this opportunity to, yeah, uh, you, you could see it as a put option to sell the subsidiary to the subsidiary stakeholders uh, in exchange, on, and, and the price sort of is the fixed uh, claims that uh, stakeholders have in the uh, uh, sub subsidiary. So the parent can walk away from the subsidiary without having to, uh, to bear any of the additional losses uh, from the subsidiary. OK, um, is this of any value uh, to the firm? Uh, one way to, to frame this question is by asking, are there alternatives to limiting uh, the liability of the firm and confining uh, subsidiary stakeholders to the assets uh, within the subsidiary? And, and one idea that, that could come to mind is that this, uh, the, the parent could simply uh, decide that whenever the value of the business unit that, that it's not holding as a separate subsidiary, but that, that it's holding as part of the unitary firm, the unitary firm, um, that whenever that the value of that subsidiary threatens to fall below zero, threatens to become negative and therefore to, to encumber the, uh, the, as, the, the outside assets of the firm, whenever that, that's, uh, that's hap that, that happens, then uh, the business unit is going to, to be liquidated. Um, I think that that's in principle that that's a viable hedging strategy. The problem is, uh, oh, oh, if 
the bankruptcy option is of, of any value to the firm, it has to do with the limitations of that hedging uh, strategy. And I would argue there is in fact such a limitation, which is that many value declines in uh, the subsidiary, in the, in the uh, business unit can be discontinuous so that uh, at the point in time when the, when the, when the uh, firm decides to liquidate the business units, there will be additional uh, losses that then will have to be covered uh, from the outside uh, assets uh, of the firm, the, the, firm uh, the, the assets outside the, the business unit. Okay, one obvious case is tort liability. Uh, when that hits uh, then easily, and, and that's of course driving this, this idea of uh, corporate groups as, as, as an externality, uh, then it could be that uh, the liability exceeds the uh, uh, subsidiaries net, net assets and therefore uh, if, if it's not organized as a separate uh, subsidiary, uh, those uh, additional or this, this, this excess liability will have to be covered from uh, the group's outside assets. Um, debt claims could be another uh, instance where this happens and, and in fact I, I think that that's pretty straightforward that this happens. So when uh, the, uh, uh, the subsidiary or the, the business units borrows and then uses those funds to to uh, invest in in some uh, in in some assets uh, it will often happen that uh, the assets turn out not to pay off uh, because market demand is, is not there or, or anything and this new information then leads the firm to 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 to, to realize to, to understand that the asset value is in fact much lower so a discontinuous change in the value of the asset this this arrival of new information um, and at the same time, of course, the, 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 the loan stays, uh, stays for a fixed amount. So uh, the, the amount of the debt doesn't uh, change. And that too could lead to a negative uh, uh, net uh, value of the, of the subsidiary. Um, here we are again in, the, in this uh, Posnerian uh, uh, potential efficiency uh, rationale and uh, Richard Squire, who has just arrived. Uh, jointly with uh, Professor Hansman, uh, has uh, argued, I think, convincingly that uh, even though there, there's not much evidence, but but uh, presumably that that's not being used very often because uh, lenders tend to insist on on uh, holding on on, on uh, uh, obtaining guarantees from from other group entities as well. Okay, so that brings me to my uh, sort of uh, idea how how to uh, explain. Uh, and 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 build a, an efficiency rationale uh, on this uh, idea of the bankruptcy uh, option, which is um, uh, another discontinuity that that arises uh, from executory contract, that is from long-term commitments to certain stakeholders uh, over a long period of time um, that stay in place, much like the debt that that stayed even if the asset had uh, had deteriorated. Um, but, but here, uh, it is the decision of the firm to liquidate the business unit, uh, which leads revenues, operating revenues from the, uh, from the business unit to end. Uh, and yeah, and then you have uh, a decline in, uh, in, oh, fine. <laughs> in, oops, interesting. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I can do it. Yeah. Fine. Oh, it's it's not being shown I online. Think okay. Uh, are we good? Okay. okay. So, um, so what happens if the firm decides to discontinue the? Uh, the, the the business unit, uh, the long-term commitments stay, but the revenue goes goes away essentially, and uh, this uh, imposes a sort of penalty on on uh, on liquidating uh, a business unit, which might ha then have to be borne out of uh, the outside uh, assets uh, of the firms. Uh, that, that is the idea, uh, and I would argue that that this aspect of uh, of a firm's uh, obligations may have been overlooked or not, not fully appreciated because it doesn't appear on the balance sheet. Executory contracts, uh, I mean, there are now exe uh, exceptions for, for leases, but as a general rule, uh, executory contracts 
just don't show on the balance sheet, but that doesn't mean that they are not very meaningful in, in, uh, in terms of, of uh, the amount of obligations. Okay, uh, now let's, let's ask how this bankruptcy option could uh, play out in, in providing incentives to uh, stakeholders. Uh, and for that, we should start with the, with the question how the parent is going to, uh, to use that, uh, that ad additional uh, opportunity, the, the bankruptcy option. So let's take uh, a car maker again, Volkswagen, uh, and it's wholly on subsidiary uh, Seat in this instance. Uh, as you know, Volkswagen is uh, selling cars under its own uh, brand uh, as, as uh, Volkswagen AG, but it also produces uh, engines that are then delivered to, to Seat and, and uh, are used by Seat to manufacture cars and then sell uh, to the outside market. So uh, when you when you think about the value of this uh, firm, then uh, you'll end up with, with uh, three different elements. One is the, uh, the net present value of the firm's activities outside unrelated to the uh, subsidiary. So that's, that's one aspect. Then obviously, because the subsidiary is wholly owned, um, do you need? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thanks. Good. Okay, the subsidiary is wholly owned, so uh, any cash flows to the subsidiary also uh, can, can at least uh, uh, increase the, 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 the value uh, of the group. So that, that's what I would call the subsidiary's internal value for the firm. And then there's also uh, the, the cash flows that uh, accrue to the, uh, to the firm, to the group, uh, from the parent's own delivery supplies to the uh, subsidiary, uh, and uh, insofar as that uh, creates profits, that would would be a separate uh, source of value for the firm, which I would call the subsidiary's external uh, of a value, external meaning outside the subsidiary. It's a profit a source of, of positive cash flows um, for the firm from the subsidiary's activities, but that is occurring outside uh, the subsidiary. Now, um, if you follow my uh, the, the following little uh, little sort of uh, stylized. Uh, story, we could think that when the firm set up the, the original uh, structure, it had in mind something like this, and now the, the bars are meant to, to indicate uh, the amount of or, or the, the, uh, yeah, the amount of, of, uh, of the three value uh, components. So it could have envisaged some, something like uh, this, and now we have to deal with these uh, uh, stakeholder uh, fixed claims under uh, executory contracts such as the the, the, the firm's payroll. And uh, let's just assume that uh, with this little sort of rake uh, uh, shaped uh, bar, I'm trying to express that part of this subsidiary value is being claimed, can be claimed by uh, the stakeholders of the subsidiaries uh, due to their fixed claims, long term uh, fixed claims against the subsidiary. So that's what they had in mind. They had in mind a subsidiary that is profitable, that has positive. Uh, a net present value for the firm, plus uh, deliveries to the subsidiary will create uh, uh, profits, will, will have positive uh, net asset value, uh, net present value. Uh, and then there's, of course, the, the operations outside uh, the subsidiaries. Now, uh, let's assume there's slack uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the subsidiary and also uh, trade unions bargain hard and, and the, the um, uh, fixed claims uh, expand, then something like this could happen. Um, this is still uh, okayish for the for the parent for the firm because it's still the the operation of the subsidiary as a whole internal and external uh, value in some still uh, are, uh, create a positive net uh, present value uh, for the firm. Now, uh, but if this development like continues, then we could end up someplace here where the fixed claims, long-term fixed claims, so. This is capitalized uh, future cash flow, so that, that's the idea. But the, the fixed claims reduce those, those cash flows, and those cash flows uh, could start to encroach uh, not only on the value uh, of, of 
cash positive cash flows to the subsidiary, uh, but also on the uh, on the uh, on the on the value of the operations outside the, the subsidiaries, not linked to the subsidiary. And if that happens, of course, the the firm would want to get rid of the subsidiary. The problem is, without an ba a bankruptcy option, it would bear this uh, liquidation penalty, and that could lead it to even tolerate this negative net present uh, value of the subsidiary. So, so it, it could stick to the subsidiary if the liquidation uh, penalty is, is sufficiently uh, uh, severe. Okay, that's the first part. When does the, the parent exercise the, the bankruptcy option? Um, so with a back bankruptcy option, it would, it would kill the subsidiary in, in, in the uh, lowermost uh, uh, bar because, because there's no reason, given that the bankruptcy option eliminates the liquidation penalty, there's no reason for the, for the parents, uh, for the parent to, to bear these, uh, yeah, that this, this negative uh, subsidiary value that uh, encroaches on uh, its, its, its uh, rest of the firm value. Um, so that's one aspect when the firm is going to exercise the bankruptcy option. Uh, there's a second aspect uh, and that has to do with the fact that because of the bankruptcy uh, option, the firm knows it, it will never have to uh, to bear uh, these uh, net losses produced by the subsidiary if the net value of the subsidiary goes below be, below zero, becomes negative, then the firm will just abandon the subsidiary. And because that is so, the firm is not going, is not willing to invest anymore in the subsidiary if too much of the value generated by uh, that investment is going to be consumed by the uh, uh, long-term commitments to the outside uh, stakeholders. Uh, and that, I would argue, is, is really something, I mean, it's, it's somewhat akin to the familiar debt overhang that, that, that we know that arises with uh, limited liability, but it's, it's different because it really has to do with this uh, sharing of, of cash flows over time uh, between uh, the firm and its outside uh, stakeholders, subsidiary uh, stakeholders. And I, I believe that this is important because uh, this kicks in uh, even before the bankruptcy, I mean, even before the, the firm considers exercising uh, the bankruptcy option. Okay, what does all of this do to stakeholder uh, uh, incentives? Uh, as we've said, uh, stakeholders have these uh, hold these uh, fixed claims. That that's what we assume. Those claims contain rents, quasi rents, so they uh, they turn again for for those uh, uh, stakeholders. And given that they are long term, uh, they create a sizable net present value for the individual uh, stakeholder. And we know this from uh, studies. I mean, there, there are plenty of studies about job displacement for employees that th this leads to uh, sizable uh, financial losses and also uh, other non-financial uh, losses to this group of uh, stakeholders. So uh, given that uh, there is this value of, of stakeholder uh, positions, uh, that value is now contingent on the probability of bankruptcy. Uh, of the subsidiary, which is more likely because the, the parent uh, uh, can uh, can can bankrupt the, the subsidiary at, at, at lower cost uh, than without the bankruptcy option. Um, and that, of course, means that probably probability goes up as uh, triggering the bankruptcy option becomes more likely. And also it, it goes up when, when there's commitment overhang, because that means the, the parent is no or is, is going to invest less in the subsidiary, and that's going to deteriorate uh, uh, over time uh, the value of the uh, subsidiary and and then uh, uh, the bankruptcy option becomes becomes more relevant so all of this uh, implies I, I would think that uh, the value of those stakeholder uh, uh, position becomes sensitive to to uh, the equity position the total equity position uh, internal and external uh, of the parent in the subsidiary and that uh, will serve to to incentivize uh, non-contractable uh, effort. And also, uh, if there is commitment overhang, uh, it will incentivize stakeholders to be willing to, to, uh, to cut back on their, on their uh, fixed claims to, to, to eliminate this uh, commitment uh, overhang. There is, of course, a problem of collective action among uh, the stakeholders. But uh, well, uh, we see other instances where where incentives are provided on a collective basis. So there are probably reasons to, uh, to, to expect uh, that uh, in spite of the collective action problem, there will be a positive uh, uh, incentive effect uh, on the performance of the subsidiary. 
Okay, given that this is a uh, symposium, again, in honor of Professor Hansman, uh, one question to ask is, uh, is this bankruptcy uh, option in any way essential? Is this something that we could mimic uh, with uh, contractual uh, means, this, this uh, sort of setup of long-term fixed claims that then become contingent on uh, the performance of the subsidiary? And I would argue uh, that it is something that you could, could not uh, uh, accomplish as well uh, purely with contractual uh, uh, tools. Uh, and the reason is that this bankruptcy option is, is like a termination, right, in, in long-term contracts. So it, it, uh, it sort of weakens the, the long-term, the binding long-term character of those, uh, of those uh, contracts. But it does so only conditional on the performance of the subsidiary as a whole. In other words, the, the parent has only the choice between either respecting its long-term commitments, all of them, or abandoning all of them uh, by bankrupting uh, the subsidiary. And that, as I uh, alluded to in the, in the beginning, is, is somehow reminds me somehow of, of this uh, uh, idea of uh, in the A.R. Tansman uh, papers. Uh, about bundling uh, uh, contracts and making them, them assignable only uh, in the aggregate, uh, combined uh, in a combined fashion, but not uh, individually. Um, it is important, I, I think, because it uh, it means that this long-term binding character of those executory contracts remains relevant because it's it's still binding on the on the parent. Uh, it constrains parent uh, opportunism in regard to, to individual uh, stakeholders. But uh, yeah, on the other hand, it, it has this, it creates this incentive effect. And, and I, would, I would argue that, that this cannot be, uh, cannot be reproduced purely by uh, contractual means, or it would be very difficult uh, to accomplish this. One last word, and with that I'll end. Um, it is, of course, a default uh, rule in the sense that uh, even if you set up this subsidiary structure, individual stakeholders could still uh, bargain for an opt out by uh, insisting on liability of the parent or other uh, group entities, uh, and that's what happened. What's what's happening with uh, with lenders, uh, and that was the reason I I uh, bracketed them uh, off uh, and 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 focused here on this non these non financial uh, stakeholders. And with that, I land and turn over, I guess, to my Thank event. you. Thank you very much. So, Maribel, Chan is going to be the discussion. It's good. Okay. So, uh, thank you so much, Andreas. This has been a very interesting paper. Um, I have um, enjoyed reading this paper uh, very much. There are many ideas, and also provides a micro analysis of um, about group formation and um, this is especially use, useful and available you know because she delights on problems that are not that well understood uh, by the traditional legal scholars and let me quote Henry Hansman in one very old article saying there appears to be a no invisible hand constantly pushing legal scholarship in the direction of relevance and utility. But I think this, uh, this project contributes into this direction. So, um, but well, as Henry usually says, um, one of the reasons we make, uh, se we have seminars is uh, to kick ideas around. So this is what I'm trying to do right now. So um, this paper uh, explore the reasons behind group formation, okay? And uh, the main reason, the key reason of uh, group formation that has been raised in the literature is limited liability. So here the idea is like uh, shareholders use or benefit from limited liability and asset partitioning by um, setting up subsidiaries, okay? And doing so, um, creators of the subsidiary and their claims are cut off uh, from the rest of the group assets, okay? So this idea, you know, um, seems I, it was very, very successful. But uh, what happened is that it has been challenged by empirical evidence. Because guess what? 
um, creditors, sophisticated creditors, can anticipate exposed expropriation um, in hands of, of, of uh, shareholders. And uh, how can, and, and they can protect themselves ex ante. And how can they do this? Well, they can demand the parent to pledge assets or to provide warranties in order to let to the subsidiaries. So this paper departs from this view and it takes another route, okay? And uh, the paper highlights not the financial leverage, but the operating leverage. And, um, and so the idea is, okay, um, financial creditors can anticipate, but operating stakeholders cannot. So workers and suppliers have long-term contracts with the firm. And, um, and uh, setting up a subsidiary uh, makes that their the claims are, are cut off uh, from, from, group, from group assets and cash flows, okay? And uh, so this benefit, that had two benefits for a parent. One is uh, it makes easier to default on the implicit long-term claims of these operating stakeholders. And also uh, because bargaining power of operating stakeholders is reduced uh, in a subsidiary, this um, may also lead to increased surplus in the relationship between firm and operating stakeholders, okay? So let me make some questions and also, and also uh, give some, some comments. The first one is about the interplay between um, financial leverage and operating leverage. And perhaps it's worth to look a little bit into it. Because I mean, if the subsidiary reduces the bargaining power of operating stakeholders, I mean, this is good news for financial uh, creditors because they are better off. And this can lead to more financial leverage and get into a, a vicious cycle. Okay, one of the main assumptions uh, of the paper is that bankruptcy is the only option to terminate long-term operating contracts. But is this really so? Because, you know, exit options actually exist in long-term contracts. And they are typically um, just a short-term contract with indefinite renewal every year, every couple of years. So, I mean, just take the example of a lease, okay? In a lease, the leasee may terminate the contract before expiration uh, of the term paying a cancellation fee, okay? And the, the price of the cancellation fee may be cheaper, may be less than bankruptcy costs. Okay, this paper also focuses on legal enforcement, okay? But there are other incentives, other mechanisms to make parties honor a contract that are not legal. And I think this is exactly the case with long-term contracts or long-term relationships, because, you know, uh, they are many, they are essentially rational, uh, rational contracts, which mean they are based on um, reputation. So, um, and reciprocity. So in this case, I mean, if the relational dimension is what has incentives for the party to honor the contract, then, you know, bankruptcy option will be of little value because it will hurt badly the reputational capital of, of the parent, okay? So what we see in practice very often is that, you know, when multinational uh, companies leave a country, they do not make the subsidiary to, to file uh, for bankruptcy. What they do is they liquidate. Uh, they liquidate the, the subsidiary, but I mean, paying in full the creditors and, um, or, or even, you know, facilitate uh, the sale of the subsidiary, subsidizing it, okay? And, and this is because of the relational, uh, I mean, for the reputational uh, reasons. Okay, another, another point here is that, I mean, does the theory explain the actual use of subsidiaries? Because given the advantage claim here, one would expect a proliferation, you know, liars and liars of subsidiaries. And that's not exactly what we see in practice. So when one, when, when we observe groups, uh, subsidiaries are joint ventures with local partners or providers of certain 
specialized assets. But of course, they have minority uh, shareholders in the capital, in the ownership in this case, or subsidiaries for different national markets, more than for product or, or output markets. And, and you know, this suggests that regulatory arbitrage is more important than operational leverage with the stakeholders. We see also this, for instance, in the private equity setting. So in the private set equity setting, we see um, these uh, vertical crops. So at the top is the operating company, and then there are layers and layers of companies, and uh, most layers save only tax purposes. Okay, one of your main points is about incentives, okay? Uh, I'm quoting you here, the parent's ability to severe the subsidiary creates an incentive for managers, employees, and other stakeholders to keep the subsidiary profitable and productive for the firm at large. Okay, yes, I share, I share, this, um, I share this, uh, this idea, but the, I think this is also true for a single firm. So, um, you know, the, the risk of bankruptcy it's also a stick for counterparty to just claims. Another point is about this non-contractible effort you know, that you have talked about. And I, I really cannot understand why this cannot be replicated through contracts. I mean, especially for managers and contract counterparties. And a last comment about the efficiency in the third scenario, you know, there are, um, there has been established by uh, good uh, literature that the uh, reduced assets level, only the subsidiary alters optimal levels of care in negligence. Okay, this is just an idea, an additional, an additional comment, but I think this paper will benefit for a more, for a formal model. I think that will help to clarify many of the issues that are brought up in the paper. Um, well, this is my last slide, okay? Um, and it has to do with, again, with efficiency. So the explanation, this explanation that you put forward uh, in this paper only looks at what happens post. So assume that the stakeholders cannot anticipate, okay? But, but let's assume that they can, they can anticipate, okay? So risk adverse uh, workers may anticipate this provision and ask for higher wages or for higher employment protection for more regulation, okay? Or informed suppliers anticipate bankruptcy and extend less trade credit, okay? Then we perhaps are not, we are uh, getting in an inefficient arms race, okay? Is the group a suboptimal outcome of the firm's inability to commit not to create subsidiaries? So I think this is the important question because I mean, if groups only serve for the, you know, the opportunistic behavior of, of shareholders against creditors and perhaps also against minority shareholders, um, then, then the problem here is that, you know, shareholders cannot credible commit that they are not going to set up a subsidiary, okay? Because they because shareholders control the corporate structure. So, are there ways to avoid this commitment problem, okay? Um, and this is my 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 last comment. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. So I understand that now we are moving to the second uh, paper and then we will have time uh, for questions and answers to all the presenters and, and discussions. Okay. So, uh, Mariana, uh, would you like to take the floor now? <laughs> OK. 
Okay, so um, now uh, we have the second paper in the session, which is entitled uh, The New Corporate Law of Corporate Groups. Uh, and it will be presented by Mariana uh, Partlender uh, from uh, the uh, Law School in Sao Paulo. Uh, thank you. First, uh, congratulations to Mary Bell for putting together the seminar in honor of Henry Hansman, uh, also for following his preferred format of having discussion of new work and, and workshops. Uh, he, he's always said, oh, let's workshop this paper. People will write the paper for us. I don't think people ever wrote papers for me, but they are always uh, immensely, comments are always immensely helpful. And I think this is what academia is about. So this is, this really follows Henry's um, format. So this paper is on the new corporate law of corporate groups. Corporate groups is really an old topic. How could be people be taught, <laughs> purporting to say something new about it? And I think the reason is that uh, Hansman, together with Krockman, has really have really inspired uh, a new field of work. Um, I'm starting here with a basic proposition that enterprises today, and it has been like that for 50 years, maybe 100 years, they are not constituted as single legal entity, but as groups of companies uh, with multiple subsidiaries, each with distinct legal personality. The question that I'm asking in this project is a different one from the one Hansman and Crackman have focused on. He has focused on the relationship between entities and creditors. And I'm asking the question, how is it that corporate law treat entity boundaries? So I'm using a new analytical framework and comparative analysis to answer this question. And when I'm we're talking about corporate law, I'm talking primarily about the rights of shareholders, not the rights of creditors. Um, so prior literature, and that's, that is, uh, of course, Hansman Crackman and also Hansman Crackman and Squire have posited that the primary economic function of legal entities is the provision of asset partitioning. That is the division between the assets of the corporation and the assets of shareholders for purposes of the rights of creditors. We know there are exceptions to asset partitioning, the most famous of which is, is veil piercing. All of that is very important. But I, in my previous work and also in this project, have explored another dimension of corporate separateness, which I argue is also economically very important which I have termed regulatory partitioning, meaning the distinction between the sphere of the company, the legal sphere of the company, and the legal sphere of shareholders for purposes of the imputation of various rights and duties that do not have anything to do with asset partitioning. And you can have a discussion about regulatory partitioning in various areas of law. And here I would like to have this discussion focusing on corporate law. I have also termed the exception to regulatory partitioning, um, veil peaking. So on the one hand, you have a growing literature focusing on asset partitioning and monetary liability to creditors. Here I'm going to be focusing on, and now I'm offering um, slightly different terminology, entity transparency as an exception to regulatory partitioning not with respect to creditors, but with respect to shareholder rights. So here are some examples. You have shareholders, a parent company, a subsidiary. This, of course, is simplified, but it shows the, the issues that I'm thinking about. So shareholders have various rights in various jurisdictions, such as the right to sue directors for breaches of fiduciary duty, the right to approve sales of all or substantially all of a company's assets, the right to inspect a corporation's books and records, and so on and so forth. The question I'm addressing here is that how does corporate law relate to those separate legal personalities? Are shareholders' rights limited to the parent company, or do they pass through to cover corporate subsidiaries? Clearly, if they don't pass through, you will have a reduction in the shareholder rights. Um, and the way I approach this question is through a comparative study 
of various jurisdictions, US, UK, France, Germany, Brazil, India, and Japan. Those are the same jurisdictions examined in the anatomy of corporate law by Hansman and others, except, sorry, Sergio, I swapped Italy <laughs> for another I country, India, so we would have another country from the global south. I'm very sorry about that. Oh. Uh, maybe you can let, then um, uh, tell us something about India. And, and this effort produces some key findings. One, and, and this is really in the spirit of Henry Hansen's scholarship, is an evolutionary finding. So I claim there is rising entity transparency of corporate law across jurisdictions. You have a clear trend in that respect. The second finding, which is also very much resonates with um, with uh, Henry's work is that there are, however, comparative differences. There are differences in the pace of adoption of entity transparency around the world, giving to their heretofore unnoticed gaps in investor protection. And finally, I also have a, a decoupling finding or claim, which is that the decoupling of what? Well, decoupling of the treatment of asset partitioning vis-a-vis -vis creditors and entity transparency vis-a-vis -vis shareholders. So there is no clear correlation between the two. So it's not that some countries take legal personality very seriously and others do not, but that uh, they might proceed it differently. So for instance, the UK um, take, takes asset partitioning quite seriously, but is a leader in entity transparency. Brazil does not take asset partitioning very seriously, but is a laggard in entity transparency in corporate law. Mm. So, so this um, table, which is actually not in the paper, well, it is in the paper, but not with colors, unfortunately. Um, so it, it, it gives you um, a glimpse of the findings. So I, the paper also goes through other issues that are country specific, but for purposes of some visualization, I collected rules that are quite common across jurisdictions so we can see a trend. So basically orange means no entity transparency. Um, green or blue? That's a question. Do you see it as green or blue? Um, mm -hmm. I'll say I see it as green. So, so green is entity transparency, with dark green being entity transparency having been adopted after 2000 or strengthened after 2000. So we see here a whole lot of green and also a whole lot of uh, dark green, su suggesting that a lot of this evolution is um, is quite recent. Um, so I'll now say a few words about some specific countries, beginning with the United States. So the classic work of Burley and Means um, said in 1932 that holding company directors held all the power of directors and also held all the powers of shareholders in subsidiaries. Mm -hmm. You know what? This is no longer the case. Now shareholder 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 rights. Um, come from parent company shareholders that now exercise such rights in a past through fashion. In the US, some of those developments are now quite old. Double derivative suits became broadly accepted in the 1940s, but some are in other respects quite recent. So password rights when it comes to inspection of books, books and records came to Delaware in 2003, and that was a response to the Enron scandal, which concerned accounting wrongdoing in subsidiaries. And approval of major asset sales became, um, uh, was included in the Delaware statute in as late, I would say, as 2005. Also another major aspect of US corporate law is now director's liability for regulatory compliance oversight, the so-called care mark claims. And one unnoticed aspect of care mark claims is that it applies in a pass-through fashion. Many of the karma cases do not concern wrongdoing at the parent level, but rather at the subsidiary level. And decisions are mostly entity blind. So in, in this case, the lower court raised the issue. This, the Delaware Supreme Court, then uh, in an opinion written by then Chief um, Justice um, Leo Strine said, said that ultimately, the Court of Chancery sensibly and properly collapsed the enterprise, ignored entity boundaries for purposes of analyzing the complaint. 
And, and, and in this graph, I show the evolution of entity transparency in U.S. state corporation statutes um, beyond Delaware. There are other states in the U.S. It's crazy to forget, but there are other states in the U.S. Uh, corporate law beyond uh, Delaware. And we, uh, and we see um, a clearly um, upward trend in the, in, in the embrace of entity transparency in other state statutes as well. And this, of course, underestimates the importance of entity transparency because many states have um, adopted entity transparency through case law and interpretation of existing statutes, not through explicit uh, statutory amendments. The UK is an interesting case because the, the conventional, conventional wisdom um, in company law books and also in comparative law tells us that the UK, quote unquote, is the starkest example of non-intervention by not regulating corporate groups. UK, we are told, UK law, we are told, does not address groups as such. It's formalistic, it's entity-centric, and say, well, it depends on what you're looking at. If you're gonna be looking at um, shareholder rights, in reality, the UK is a leader in entity transparency. Also, Japan, traditionally deemed by the literature to be highly formalistic, but in reality, it's the place where there were the most deliberate reforms in embracing entity transparency in that they had the theory in their minds. It's really interesting because the theory came from Melvin Eisenberg, a US scholar writing in the 1960s and 70s that was that is now completely forgotten in the US, but German scholars read him and took him very seriously. But did the opposite of what he said. Oh, oh, I, I can get to that. But then Japanese scholars saw the problem through German scholarship and embraced entity transparency very deliberately by adopting a statutory um, change, granting get pass through um, rights with respect to specials of books and records in 1999 and double derivative suits more recently in 2014. Um, I would like now to get to the law and economics of entity transparency. And here I suggest that the law and economics of entity transparency with respect to shareholder rights is very different from the law and economics of um, uh, asset partitioning with respect to creditor rights. And that is because um, creditor rights and shareholder rights have a different legal and economic nature. So we heard from Andreas that asset partitioning vis-a-vis -vis creditors can, at least in theory, reduce creditors' monitoring costs and therefore generate efficiency gains. But regulatory partitioning vis-a-vis -vis shareholders can actually increase agency costs because shareholders will be necessarily exposed to, to, the, to, to the economics, the financial um, situation of the subsidiary. They're not cut off, they're exposed to it. Delaware courts are right. It doesn't matter from a shareholder's perspective if the wrongdoing and the huge fine came from the parent or came from the sub. So any transparency, I claim, makes a lot of sense when it comes um, to shareholder rights. There are, of course, challenges associated with anti transparency and costs as everything in life. One of them is, well, where are you going to draw the line at 100% ownership, at majority ownership, at control. These are differences of line drawing. I don't think they're insurmountable. Consolidated accounting is now universal, and you draw the line somewhere. And if you think that's a huge obstacle, say, just go with whatever the lines are drawn for purposes of consolidated accounting, because that's already happened. So we, we can have a discussion about that's the best way to draw a line for every single issue. Another challenge, and this is really interesting from my perspective, uh, from a legal perspective, concerns the potential for extraterritorial application. And its transparency entails extraterritorial application, almost by definition, given that so many subsidiaries are constituted in other jurisdictions. So I actually think that the internal affairs rule applies, but, but, but really, um, very often, because of entity transparency, it's it's the laws of the parent company that apply. So I said in the paper a case uh, that was, I think, a triple or quadruple derivative suit to cover a French company. So the French company is then subject to to um, 
to to um, uh, a derivative suit in um, in in Delaware, and that is that can be problematic. I don't think that's tragic, but it can be problematic in, put, in creating potentially disparate shareholder rights in partially owned um, subsidiaries. And also, perhaps one could claim that a subsidiary in Brazil, because Brazil is different, is best suited by a certain legal regime, the Brazilian legal regime, or a subsidiary in a certain industry is best suited, um, is best served by a, a different legal regime and integrated transparency collapses and collapses that. Um, I also discuss uh, how one would explain comparative differences that we would see. And I see more in the paper, but here I would, I would just like to highlight um, two, um, two variables that I think are important. One is a very traditional variable in terms of explaining comparative um, comparative differences, which is the role of ownership structures. And here in particular, I'd like to point out that wholly owned subsidiaries provide the strongest and most intuitive case for entity transparency. And the US and the UK differ from other jurisdictions in having most really the vast majority of subsidiaries to be wholly owned. So I think that helps explain why they got to enter transparency first. Um, Another variable often discussed in the literature is the common law versus civil law distinction. And this is interesting here because let's say India is a common law jurisdiction, but it's also a laggard um, in anti-transparency, whereas we saw Japan categorized as a civil law jurisdiction have, has, uh, has um, made a lot of progress in that direction in, in recent years. And I think this recognition of the rise of entity transparency in corporate law also has broad implications about other areas of law. I'm quoting here John Ruggie, who inaugurated a, an agenda. I don't think he inaugurated, but he really gave a lot of um, impulse to the business and human rights agenda, which I think is now a big thing in Europe. Europe's coming, going to come up with a directive on, on business and human rights. Um, and, and he noted in his work um, that legal systems worldwide have strong public, public policies in favor of the legal autonomy of subsidiaries. And as such as well, depending on what you're looking at, corporate law itself don't view them that seriously. That does not view corporate separateness as sacrosanct. It views it something to be upheld when it makes sense and to be disregarded when it makes sense. So, um, and I would also note that the rise of entity transparency has already reduced the legal autonomy of subsidiaries, which are not longer completely autonomous, but are rather subject to pass-through rights uh, coming from, from parent company shareholders. So in terms of conclusions and implications, corporate law does not treat corporate separateness as sacrosanct. Overcoming corporate separateness does not invariably require exceptional circumstances. Actually, corporate law embraces entity transparency in a strict and routine fashion, not only in cases of fraud or, or abuse, that is the new trend. And corporate separateness is a policy choice, and the case for entity transparency in corporate law in particular is often strong. Yeah. So now we move to the discussion. Okay. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thanks for the thanks to the organizer, to Maribel in particular for the invitation. Um, oh, I, okay. Huh. Ah, okay. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Again, good afternoon to everybody. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks for the invitation, Maribel. I'm very happy to be here. Before starting, I would like to spend a few words uh, uh, about uh, Professor Hasman. I wasn't, uh, unfortunately, I wasn't uh, a, a scholar or a, a student of Eric Hasman. I, I, I don't know him in person, but uh, I read many of his works. He wrote, but you, you all know this, many groundbreaking and foundational papers. And these papers, this scholarly, scholarly work of Eric Hasman, influenced the, not just you know my, my my scholarly production but also but 
but the very way I, I, I used to think about corporate law. So I am very honored to be to be here at this um, uh, at this tribute. Uh, coming to my to 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 the comments to Mariana's paper, I would like to point out first that in in my opinion this is a this is a really good paper. It's a very it's very thoughtful and it is also a very informative paper. Uh, it is and it, it is a, a, an aspect that I appreciate a lot. A very rich in comparative analysis. It's easy to see that there's a there's a lot of work behind uh, behind this paper and I really uh, enjoyed it. Um, I have I have basically basically a couple of of comments on the paper. Uh, so the paper views uh, what Mariana calls entity uh, transparency or, or veil peaking uh, uh, mainly as a tool for the protection of shareholders against the, the special agency problems posed by the group uh, structure. Uh, according to this view, entity transparency is um, uh, basically a solution that the, the corporate law offers against the the abuse, or perhaps more correctly, the self-interested use of the uh, corporate or of the group structure by group controllers, be them uh, managers or, or controlling uh, shareholders. The paper, uh, uh, I, and this is my my view, of course, convincingly explains uh, how controllers may in fact, more easily escape shareholder scrutiny by structuring the firm as a group instead as of as a single entity firm. It also equally convincingly explains um, how entity transparency may effectively address this, uh, this problem. Uh, and I fully share Mariana's view that uh, uh, this is something that she does not uh, explicitly points out in the paper. It's uh, uh, something that I, uh, a view that I, in any case, see in the paper, uh, uh, the idea that in companies with dispersed ownership, uh, uh, these entity transparency tools, uh, this veil picking is unconditionally valuable because it decreases essentially these special managerial agency costs uh, uh, linked to the choice of the group structure. I have a slightly different view with respect to companies that have a controlling shareholder because i think that in this case so the uh, uh, the idea is that of a of a parent company on top of a big group and this parent company has uh, in turn a controlling shareholder it may also have minority shareholder it might or might not be a listed company but it has a controlling shareholder with respect to a controlled company, I think two qualifications are in order. First, whether with respect to these companies, uh, entity transparency works as a minority shareholder protection tool vis-a-vis -vis the controlling shareholder crucially depends on the specific configuration of this pass-through uh, rights. To work as a tool of minority shareholder protection, these rights must be granted also to minority shareholders. They should not be a prerogative only of controlling shareholders. If these rights are awarded only to the majority, for example, I would say because their exercise depends, uh, uh, let's say, on a uh, deliberation of the general meeting, okay, then they lose any capacity to, 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 to be used as a minority protection tool. From the description that Mariana provides of these rights throughout the paper, uh, they appear to be available, or mostly of them appear to be available also to the minority, but this is my suggestion. It could be useful to address this aspect more uh, explicitly in the paper and try to give a full account also of the conditions, if any, upon which shareholders may get access to this uh, entity transparency or, or pass-through uh, rights. The second point, which is related to what I, to what I just said, uh, uh, is, uh, and this is pretty intuitive, of course, in, in a controlled company, 
the existence of uh, this pass-through rights, entity transparency, alters the distribution of power between the controlling shareholder on the one hand and the board of directors in favor of the controlling shareholder, of course. Of course, I am, I am assuming here that these pass-through rights are available also to the controlling shareholder on top of, uh, of the group. So what happens is that the controlling shareholder essentially gains power at the expense of the board of directors. My view is that this could be a source of increased rather than decreased agency costs or agency problems whenever the board happens to uh, act as a curb on controlling shareholders' uh, um, willingness to extract private benefits uh, of control. And this is not necessarily something uh, rare, okay? Uh, uh, it might be especially the case of a board of directors of a listed company, for example. We all know that uh, uh, the board of directors of listed companies almost everywhere in the world are, uh, you know, there are many independent directors. They, they perform mostly a monitoring function. There are also in some jurisdictions, Italy, for example, minority appointed directors to uh, enhance this monitoring uh, function. So it may well be that in some of these companies, the board of directors, instead of being, you know, a executor of the, you know, uh, controlling shareholders' uh, uh, desires and preferences and, and whatever, might be a, an internal body which acts as a limit, as a barrier against the controlling shareholder appetite for uh, for private benefits of control. When this is the case, so in this scenario, entity transparency may essentially help the controlling shareholder bypass, okay, uh, or circumvent the, the, the board of directors and therefore may increase the overall agency costs in, uh, 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 in the company because it helps overcoming the, the barrier represented by the board of directors. If you don't have pass-through rights, you have to uh, rely on the board of directors and if the board of directors is fairly independent he may not you know always uh, uh, follow your instructions or uh, and so uh, let, 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 let me make an exemplification an example uh, you uh, cite among these pass through rights the right to uh, inspect the subsidiary books and records okay uh, that uh, is, uh, uh, as far as I remember, has been awarded, for example, in, in Delaware since 2000 and at, at the beginning of, uh, of 2000. Um, well, in a subsidiary's books and records, there might be valuable business information. There might be corporate opportunities that could be exploited. And, well, it might also be the case that the that that subsidiary has been established also for the purpose of keeping that information away from influence shareholders like like a controlling shareholder who might be happy to exploit these business opportunities where there are pass through rights uh, well you know uh, these rights may help uh, uh, controlling shareholders get that information therefore uh, um, and so to sum up my view is that entity transparency, uh, as long as widely held companies are concerned, is uh, a unconditionally probably beneficial uh, corporate law evolution, okay? Because it decreases managerial agency costs. In controlled companies, instead, it may not necessarily be a valuable arrangement that reduces overall agency costs. It may also work the other way around as a tool that increases rather than uh, decreasing agency agency costs and that's my i have nothing else to say thank you very much okay uh thank you very much uh and now we have some time for questions uh, and answers so um i think we have a microphone here Thank you for uh, both presentations and um, 
I want to say, first of all, uh, I, um, I, I did get here a bit late, uh, and I just wanted to say I had a very good reason. Uh, there was another conference uh, organized in this building yesterday and today by the, um, I'm not sure I'm going to get the name exactly right, but by the, um, the Spanish um, Insolvency Law Club, something like that, a charming name like this. Um, and, uh, and the very last scheduled presentation was by Jonathan Lipson. Uh, who was going to be commentating later on my paper. Uh, and so uh, it went a little bit long. Not his presentation. His presentation was fully on time, but it started a bit late, so it spilled over here. So, Andreas, I'm sorry that I missed the very beginning of your presentation. Um, and it may very well be that my question was answered at the beginning of your presentation, but I do have a question for you. Um, your hypothetical, I think, involving Volkswagen and then a subsidiary, what does that S logo stand for, the subsidiary? Yeah. Yeah. Seat. Okay, excellent. Uh, uh, very, very uh, apropos then. Well chosen. Um, so, uh, so um, I was. You, you notice. You notice this uh, possibility, which um, Casey, Anthony Casey, has talked about too, which is kind of a selective bankruptcy filing, where a corporate group just takes one subsidiary and kind of puts it into bankruptcy. Um, uh, but the rest of the uh, subsidiaries are kept out. And you noticed also, I think that the possibility of what you were talking about, that there's this external value of the subsidiary resulting from the potential for ongoing, I guess, transactions between the subsidiary and the parent, right? So the subsidiary car company, Seat, could continue even if it were spun off, for example, to enter into uh, uh, contracts, supply contracts, and so on. But value is going back and forth between the subsidiary uh, and the parent. So there's more value in that ongoing relationship than the subsidiary would have on its own. So I was wondering, what is there a potential in your model for once the subsidiary is insolvent based on simply the measure of the value of its own assets and its own liabilities, but putting aside this ongoing value from what you call, I think, called the external uh, value of the subsidiary, could the parent put the subsidiary into bankruptcy and then buy all of the assets out of uh, the, the bankruptcy proceeding and put it into a new subsidiary, simply stripping it of its old liabilities. It seems like that would be the optimal approach there, right? So it's almost, in American terms, it would be like a 363 sale of the assets of the subsidiary, but the parent's the buyer. Because then you preserve the ongoing, well, you preserve the corporate group essentially, right? You've just put the subsidiary's assets into a new uh, corporate form created to hold the assets from the old one. So you've preserved the corporate form you sorry the the group the corporate group um, you've preserved the ongoing relationship between the two uh, you have shorn the subsidiary of these liabilities that are swamping its assets and I think it's even value maximizing because I presume in a competitive auction the parent would be the highest bidder uh, be precisely because of that external value uh, that you are uh, identifying. So if you talked about that uh, uh, before I got here, I'm just recapitulating then what something you said. Um, uh, but if not, I'd like to hear your views on that or what role that, that possibility uh, do you recognize it as an option? And if so, how do, what role does it play in your view of the problem? Shall we collect? Questions or I sit. I go back to my seat. Oh, directly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great question. I've I haven't thought about this uh, way of resolving it. I think it's it's very compatible with with the idea that 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 I had. It it, it puts even more pressure on. I mean, realistically speaking, you would still need many of the stakeholders in the subsidiary, and this would be a way to uh, to renegotiate. Contracts, I guess, if you if you acquire the subsidiary's assets and then set up a new entity and 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 offer new uh, long-term contracts, but but at, at inferior terms to them. I mean that, that that would be, I guess, the 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 idea how how it work would work out. And that, yes, I, I think that that would work. Yeah, that would be one way in, in which this could play out in, in that sense. Right. So in, in, in at least the American bankruptcy code, the subsidiary could assume. Yeah. And then those could be sold with the rest of the assets in the auction. Yeah, even that uh, would be an opportunity. But 
uh, I thought the idea was to to reduce those claims, and that's why you yeah, would not. Yeah, 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 yeah. You 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 could you could like pick the the contract that that you would want and 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 leave out the, the others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More questions, Karnat. I actually have one one question for for each of the presenters. So uh, I'll, I'll start with Mariana. Um, you, you've mostly, and, and I, I know that, or I'm aware that um, you're not limiting the analysis only to um, entity transparency from uh, the top down, but also from the bottom up. I think in if, if I think of, and, and you've mentioned a, a very interesting sample of, of jurisdictions, um, but you've, um, uh, I mean, essentially omitted, uh, which perhaps for very good reasons, um, uh, continental Europe. Um, perhaps the, the closer, closer um, jurisdiction in your sample to continental Europe would be uh, Brazil. Um, in, 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 in some respects. But for instance, for uh, at least from, from, a, uh, from, from the point of view of the, uh, a continental Europe, uh, I think the entity uh, transparency f top down is not really such a large problem in reality. I think most jurisdictions tend to be sympathetic uh, to that thing where really minority shareholders have um, a very hard task ahead is when they're minority shareholders uh, down, the, down the road and they want to seek remedies um, up uh, the chain of, of the corporate group. And I'm wondering whether, um, I know that in the US is different, but I'm, I'm not sure whether, I mean, the problems are necessarily the same when you look at the things top down or uh, bottom up, because um, uh, problems are slightly different and perhaps the solution should be slightly different. I'm, I've always been very skeptical about the civil law, um, traditional view in corporate law about just, well, if you're down in in, in, um, in the pyramid, so uh, bad luck with you, but... Um, uh, but but I, I honestly don't know exactly how to rationalize that. And, and to Andreas, I, I think, you, I mean, really it's a cute notion, that of the bankruptcy option. I think it's, I, I really like it. And, and I think there is something to it. Um, I'm wondering, and again, I don't have a, a I mean, this, this is, it's probably more than uh, anecdotal evidence, but uh, I'm thinking about maybe a few cases that maybe more than 20 or, or 30 cases in which you observe uh, large multinational companies closing down national subsidiaries and things like that. I think they sometimes use the bankruptcy option, but not really with respect to stakeholders. Uh, my view is that typically they Workers, they're concerned about workers because even if, if they abandon the workers in Italy and they're a German company, really the German unions are going to be um, very angry. And very often they get some kind of uh, protection across the entire group. So there can be this, this kind of uh, common rights over the group. The same may be even true with respect to, um, to other stakeholders. I think in, in, in my... Um, in the way I see the evidence is that the bankruptcy option is typically exercised against governments uh, because they want to get out of the country. Please give me subsidies so I can have a buyer that will be interested in preserving employment. So these are the cases in which I see the, the threat value of the bankruptcy um, option is really against the government, is really against the taxpayer. Uh, so in that respect, I, I don't see the efficiency in it so clearly as, as, as you um, seem to have in mind. Yeah, I think that that's an excellent question and it ties in with uh, the, the one of the many uh, very good point, points that, that Maribel raised, which is uh, reputation, whether that uh, prevents especially 
very visible large groups from from letting uh, letting one of their subsidiaries go down the drain. Um, I, I completely agree with, with that observation. I, I think that's true. Uh, I would still think that it changes the the uh, the posture or the, the bargaining power that the I mean bargaining in the shadow of the law essentially um, uh, that the uh, parent has vis-a-vis -vis the the subsidiary and its stakeholders. And I think that, that, that's a great point about uh, about governments and and governments willingness to subsidize uh, the exit of, of large firms from, from, a, from a country. I mean, that's one instance of that, I, I, I think, because that also, uh, uh, and if, if governments are wise to, to spend taxpayers' money on that, that's a different uh, question. But, but what they do is they substitute taxpayer money for, uh, for costs that in a unitary firm, the, the firm itself would have to, to bear uh, uh, when, when it chose to, to liquidate uh, the firm. So uh, in, 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 in short, I, uh, it's, it, there's so little empirical uh, evidence about, about what happens. So one, one project I have in mind is, is looking into how often that, that happens, actually uh, insulated uh, bankruptcies of, uh, of, of group entities. Um, but, but even if, uh, if that doesn't happen very often, I mean, yeah, as we know, that doesn't mean it's, it's, not, it's not present in the, uh, in the way um, these liquidations uh, are, are processed. Um, and it, it, it does shift bargaining power, uh, that, that I would think. Yes, uh, yes, I'd like to answer both. Uh, I'd also want to answer Sergio first. Um, I really um, appreciate uh, your comments and where you're coming from, which I think is precisely the right mindset. And it's the type of division that is in the anatomy of corporate law of saying ownership structures really matter and they give rise to different agency costs and you might want to think differently about legal solutions. And that's a very important question and that is often forgotten, surprisingly, <laughs> frequently forgotten, but I don't think I forgot it. So let me, so, 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 so let me just say a few words uh, in that respect. The first point, I think you almost answered yourself, well, is the type of pass-through right, the one that would favor minority shareholders. And you said, well, I think you can address that explicitly. Most of them would, derivative suits would, inspection rights would, chain principle would. Asset sales, it depends when the, whether you allow for instance, shareholders who vote, if it's a conflict with transaction or not, maybe not. But then it's, again, not the type of right to begin with that would be designed to cure um, the controlling minority agency problem as opposed to the ma manager shareholder agency problem. So there's nothing that entity transparency affects here. The second question um, sounds right, but I don't think it, it is really right. So that's why I, I really want to to respond and the idea of kicking ideas back and forth. So that's uh, the idea that entity transparency could be perverse in controlled jurisdictions, which or, or in controlled companies, and all countries have controlled companies, and controlled companies actually dominate so many of, well, most of the world, and many of the jurisdictions that I'm talking about here. Um, but I don't think it holds because the idea, so the idea is that entity transparency would tilt the balance of power away from boards to controlling shareholders and thereby increase the controlling minority agency problem, which is the big agency problem. But that concern relies on the assumption that the board and independent directors are truly a huge, I like the way you put it, barrier against controlling shareholders. And I think there's a lot there's a lot of literature suggesting that might not be the case. It would be exactly why it's not a barrier. It's the reason why um, vertical integration works because the subsidiary is actually, it is actually controlled. Um, there are also, there's a series actually of recent studies suggesting that independent directors is the type of strategy that works better for widely held firms. If you can be, if you're appointed and can be removed by a controlling shareholder at any time. Maybe independent is even a misnomer. It's not the same as an independent agency. Um, so really, really, really. Um, so I, do, I don't think that um, changes uh, that much. So it would be an idea that also appears in the literature is that the 
there's a paper by Jonathan Macy said that there's a myth that parents don't control subsidiaries. And, and I think you can also apply it here. I would see primarily as, as a myth and I don't see boards as so much of a barrier so that this could be preferred. So I think it's actually quite helpful because otherwise controlling shareholders could, instead of practicing wrongdoing at the level of a parent, then you, you practice wrongdoing at the level of the sub and double derivative suits, uh, inspection rights and can be very helpful with respect to that. And I can tell you that in Brazilian practice, which is dominated by controlled firms, now there are a bunch of issues regarding entity transparency merging because in the absence of it, there is a temptation to a place wrongdoing by controlling shareholder at the subsidiary level in, in order to, in order to uh, avoid liability. Uh, so Fernando um, asked uh, an interesting question about continental Europe, and now I realize too late that I should have, given that we're in Europe, I should have revised my slides to give greater attention to European jurisdictions and not to, well, UK counts, but not to the US and Japan in, in my slides. Europe is very much part of the paper, though I got rid of Italy, but you have France um, and, and, and Germany in the paper. Now, some, some things that I think uh, deserve to be said. Uh, Fernando uh, uh, pushed for the issue of directions. And I think that there's something to be said about directions. There's both like vertically and upward and downward and also laterally. And I think this one of the contributions of this paper is to push against a certain view of corporate groups that suggests that it's all or nothing. It's like enterprise or entity. But I think it's more complicated than that because the type of entity transparency I'm talking about operates vertically. It does not operate laterally. Shareholder rights don't flow laterally. So, it, so I think this is a helpful conversation. And it, it's true that it can operate in both directions and scholarship has focused on, on one direction and in terms of rendering, controlling shareholders accountable, European law is quite developed, the other way around less so. I think, that, I think what I show here is, is that it's less so. One of the things I was telling Sergio just, just before this panel is that this paper is actually my first paper that started with the opposite hypothesis or claim. I thought it would see a lack of entity transparency and I was going to denounce it. Oh, how awful. Corporate law should mo move toward entity transparency. But instead I found a whole lot of entity transparency and you need it in Europe, of course, a, cha a, a mandatory bid rule would, would be meaningless if, if, if you do not have a chain principle. So by the way, everyone is green. Well, consolidated accounting the same, even in inspection rights, they are green, it's green everywhere where you have inspection rights. Not very useful to constrain inspection rights um, at the level, I mean, I know, Sarah, you had an explanation, but I don't think it's, that's what it, it, it is primarily, um, it is primarily about. So Euro, continental Europe actually has some entity transparency, it doesn't have it when it comes to derivative suits. How curious, right? It goes upward, it doesn't flow downward. I don't think there's any good explanation for it, except perhaps a political story of, of, of um, maintaining discretion or economic story, if you will, for maintaining discretion for controlling shareholders. So I think continental Europe is very much part of the story. I think what's interesting for me as a comparative person is that Germany, which is held as, oh, Germany has a lot of corporate groups. Actually, um, it does, it, it, well, it does, right? But, but, but it does not allow for anti-transparency in some important respect. So it's a laggard in, in that, in that um, dimension. So it's a part of the story. Is that a huge problem? Well, I think a lot of the problem has been solved. But I do think that so long as you believe in derivative suits, there is, there is no reason to constrain them to the level of, of the parent. Okay, um, do we have more comments or questions? So I mean, if there's, uh, I might provide one or two answers perhaps to, to some of Maribel's okay. yes, please. comments. Okay. Yeah, uh, so, um, Really excellent. Thank you so much for, for your generous, uh, uh, yeah, for, for, for investing so much time in, in this in this very uh, sort of uh, in progress uh, project. Um, 
So uh, I think you made one point that is really critical to the whole project, which is uh, whether um, contractual termination rights, I mean, essentially whether uh, to, to the degree to which those long-term contracts are actually binding, because that determines the, uh, um, the, the, the amount of, the, of this liquidation penalty that, that, that I think is, is there. And I don't really have a very, no, I, I don't have a very good answer to, uh, to it. I do just intuitively, uh, anecdotally, if, if you wish, um, I do think that, that when, when firms shut down, we see a lot of extra uh, cost that, uh, that, 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 that has to be uh, uh, put up. And, and I've tried to, to, to provide this as an, uh, as an answer. And I think to, to some degree it is, uh, it is there. I'm, I'm just not sure uh, yeah, how, how large it is and, and, and if, it's, if it's really uh, driving uh, the effect. But, but if you think about uh, the, the literature about bankruptcy costs, I mean, that tells you uh, that the mere fact that that you when you move from uh, a going concern to uh, an, uh, a debtor that uh, the future of which is uncertain to put it that way uh, you're losing a lot of uh, of firm value uh, and yeah and that tells me that, that there is this 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 extra uh, loss from 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 the liquidation decision yeah. and and maybe maybe uh, I still have to to uh, find out well, where where it actually uh, originates, uh, and then you you made this point about um, the actual use pattern in the sense of if if it's that great to have this bankruptcy option, uh, we should see it as much as possible and as fine grained as possible, and um, to to that I I, I would uh, respond. I think the if there's any virtue in in in, in this setup, it, it is that it's not the individual contract. So you don't want to have a subsidiary with each of your stakeholders, but instead you want to group stakeholders uh, in bundles, much a bit like in, in the IOT uh, enhancement uh, paper, in, in bundles that, that have complementarities and where you want these incentives to be to be uniform on, on, on everyone uh, uh, involved. And, and I think that, that could explain why, uh, why, yeah, why, why we don't see subsidiaries uh, proliferate in an inflationary uh, manner. Um, okay, that, that's what, what was on my mind so far. And, and, and uh, I'm sure you are going to share your slides. I hope so, uh, because there were many important uh, points that, that you raised. Thank you very much again. Okay, so, so I think we have one question from uh, the, the audience, uh, the remote audience. So, um, Hiroyuki, uh, would you like to make your question? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Hiroyuki Otanabe, Japanese scholar from the University of London. My question is about uh, parent subsidiary listings in corporate groups. One of the notable features of Japanese corporate groups is a large number of parent subsidiary listings. And therefore, uh, sorry, sorry. And typically, there is one central listed company in a group and many listed subsidiaries. The number of parent uh, subsidiary listings has declined sharply, sharply in recent years due to the opposition from overseas institutional investors, etc. But such this still exists. Uh, in your theoretical framework, uh, would parent subsidiary listing in a corporate group still be viewed negatively or other aspects that could be viewed positively, for example, uh, from the point of group insolvency? Thank you. Um, who wants to answer? Mariana? Um, so if I understood uh, correctly, please uh, correct me if I have not. You are discussing the issue of listing of subsidiaries in Japan, the listing of subsidiaries of listed companies. Is that the case? Is that the question? Yes, uh, it's uh, yeah. double listing, double listing, parent subsidiary listing. 
Double. Yes, double listings. Yes, yes. So it would be you. You have an IPO. You have a a publicly traded company, and then the company would make an IPO of its subsidiary, thereby creating uh, a pyramidal group. Is that is that the, the comment? I would. Uh, um, so I think this is an interesting question. Uh, how you view um, corporate um, corporate pyramids? I think there are uh, different views, and uh, you, the question suggests that there are important trade-offs. So I, my 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 paper is not about that, and so here I would just refer to a recent paper by Sergio Gelota and Luca Enriquez, which um, addresses that that question from from an economic perspective and suggests that there are um, economic benefits associated with the listings of of subsidiary shares. So there. They're countervailing um, agency cost benefits that might counterweigh uh, what you would see as an increase in agency costs re resulting from control minority structure. So I think it's a it's a heated debate. There are recent contributions to it as well as um, older contributions to it. I don't I won't weigh in favor of one view or another here. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I guess I would have also referred to to to, to that uh, paper. Um, I, to, to me, it has always seemed that that uh, admitting minority shareholders to a subsidiary in general, and in in, in particular, if if uh, the minority then is 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 uh, the minority shares are listed, is a way to obviously also strengthen the the. Uh, relative independence of the subsidiary vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, uh, the, the the parent and as such could be an element in in yeah again establishing this kind of uh, uh, sub ownership uh, in a sub uh, unit uh, of, of the firm so uh, it could be an element in, in incentivizing uh, the subsidiary to to uh, yeah I mean to, to, to seek its all in its own uh, value maximization uh, and thereby translate into into incentives not just for shareholders I mean the shareholder incentives are, are important only because uh, at the point when, when they when they provide uh, fund funds to the firm and when they turn over the, uh, capital uh, but also to 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 stakeholders uh, yeah who might be and 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 as you know um, that there is this debate about uh, list uh, stock prices being an element in incentive schemes. I mean, that, that would be another element when, when you have listed uh, stock of subsidiaries. Yeah, but but uh, taken together, I think it could be an element in in, uh, in that. Uh, I guess whether, whether that's uh, the dominant cause of, of subsidiary listings is, is, I guess, open to debate. It, uh, I mean, we have many other uh, and not, not as uh, uh, beneficial uh, stories about, about this. Thank you. Uh, didn't Germany recently do a double, a prominent double listing by listing the shares of Porsche acting Gesellschaft, yeah. which is a subsidiary of Volkswagen? Yeah. Going back yeah. to your example. Yeah. And but but there's, that has that that has a pyramidal uh, explanation, yeah. Because uh, otherwise, Volkswagen, the Volkswagen family, would, would have uh, to give up control. Okay, uh, so it has an agency a cost explanation in your view. This this double listing. Yeah, yeah, okay. in a sense, yeah. I mean, the, the, depending on on whether you view control by the Porsche family as as bad, if if you think that, then yeah. Okay, are there more questions? No? Okay, so, so then uh, we have coffee waiting for, for us here and people at home can also take a break. And we will be back at 16.15, uh, okay? Spanish time, yeah? Okay, so see you all soon. Thank you.